We are The Point, a church that loves God, loves people, and loves life. If you are interested in learning more about us, please go to our website, thepointva.com. Thanks for listening. Hey, well, today I am kicking off a brand new series. And if I can uh, just be honest with you, I'm a little bit nervous about this morning and about this series, probably more so than I have felt in a long time. And that is because normally what I'm teaching is something that I have already like worked through months in advance. And so I've worked through it. I've got it at least a little bit figured out. And now it's like, okay, now I can teach it and kind of know what the outcome is going to be. And what I'm going to be sharing this morning and throughout the course of the series is not something that I have worked through. It is something I am working through, okay? And so what I thought I would do is I wanted to bring you all along this, on this journey with me and this journey that Carrie and I are actually in together along with our entire family. So today we're starting this brand new series we're calling Reframing Family. So let me set it up this way. You know, I, um, I tend to think of like my life in terms of like the different areas of leadership that I have responsibility for. It's kind of how I, I categorize my life. And so um, it begins by just leading myself well. Like you all get that. Like if, if I'm not leading myself well, spending time with God every day, living out of the overflow of that relationship, it's going to trickle down. It's going to impact every other area of leadership as well. But if I'm doing that well, then naturally it's going to flow into leading well in my marriage. Like that's another big area of leadership. And then leading well at home with our three girls and, and our son. So leading well with our children and our family unit. And then it, it even trickles into leading well with our staff and with our, with our church. So I'm at very much what you would call probably a visionary and what I mean by that is I just like to spend time. In fact, it's probably one of my favorite aspects of my calling. I love to spend time like thinking about and dreaming about the future, like not in a discontent way, but I'm just happiest when I can spend time thinking about dreaming about the future in an imaginative way, like where is God leading us since? And so I do that a lot when it comes to like my personal life and leadership. I like to have like plans in mind and goals in mind and so on. And I do it a ton when it comes to leading the church. Like I, I like listen to podcasts. I'm reading all the time, just working on seeking God for it, developing, capturing, clarifying the vision. Like where is he leading us? And then one day I had this revelation. The Holy Spirit spoke to me. Gabe, you spend all of this time developing personal vision and you spend all of this time developing vision for like church world. What about the in-between? Like, why are you not as intentional when it comes to vision in your marriage and in your family? And it wasn't in a, like, in a way that felt condemnation, okay? I don't want you to, like, take it like that because I realize even in saying that, man, that, that kind of a statement can pierce the heart, right? That's like, man, that's a heavy, heavy way to start. It wasn't in a way that I felt condemnation. It was in a sense that it was like, okay, you're right, Lord. And now it's time to do something about it. Are you with me? And when I thought about it, when I really began to unpack that, what I began to realize was this. Is when I studied like my marriage and when I studied our parenting, one of the things I began to see was is how Carrie and I, what we had what, what I would call reactionary parenting. Meaning that when it came to the girls' personalities and nuances and behaviors, like that really would drive our conversations and our time together. And so we would like see like one of the girls just seemed a little bit off or like, you know, just kind of like, that's not right. What's going on in there? And so we would say, you know what? It's time to call time out. Let's have a date night and let's talk about it. So we would do that and we would discuss, okay, here's our plan to move forward. Let's execute the plan and then, and then so on. And that became like a consistent basis for all of our communication, and our conversation, this reactionary parenting. But then I kind of even begin to kind of peel back the layers of that more. And the futuristic thing in me, I begin to kind of play it off down the road, like, well, hold on a minute. If this continues on, like basically, and, and over the course of the next 18 years, the entire basis of our communication is going to be reactionary to the girls and their personalities, behaviors, and so on. Like what happens when the kids are all raised and gone? Like, is there going to be a day when I look at my wife and be like, who is this woman? And, and I've to be honest, like I've heard of that happening to couples before. 
And so, again, it came down to this thing that it's like, well, wait a minute. Like, well, well, let's figure out, like, what do we need to do? Everything had felt so reactionary. We were parenting and leading at a place of reaction as opposed to parenting and leading out of a place of vision. Now, those conversations about our girls and personalities and behaviors and so on, very necessary conversations. Like, for all of you that have raised children, am I right? Like, I'm not totally off on that, right? Like, you got to have those conversations. The problem is, is that when we have those conversations disconnected from a larger vision, from a bigger picture, from an overarching com- context for our lives, for our family, for our relationships. And so what this series is going to be all about, it's going to be all about how do we reframe family and the conversation around family in such a way that we're not living reactionary, but we're living visionary. And and here's the cool thing. It doesn't matter where you're at relationally. Like this series is going to be applicable, whether you're you're single and you want to date, or maybe you're dating and you're thinking, man, could this person be the one? And so whether you're dating, maybe you want to get engaged, engaged to married, like that's a huge step, or maybe you're married and you you know you want to have children, or maybe you're recently gone through separation and you're in a painful season, God has a vision for you. He has a purpose for this season of your life. Maybe you've gone through divorce and you're carrying the pain of divorce. Let me tell you, God is not finished with you. He has a purpose for you, a vision for you. Maybe there's a lot of you in this category, like you are entering into, or you have entered into the season of grandparents. Have you ever thought, like, what is God's vision for me as a grandparent and for this season of life? Because I I, I can imagine, like, you reach retirement and you think, man, I'm checking out, right? But no, no, no. What if God has something else in mind? And so what we're doing is we're talking about what does it look like to frame up this conversation through the lens of vision, reframing family, reframing the relationships that matter most. And so if you're not a note taker, I hope you will become one through this series. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. If you're not taking notes, I want you to write this down. Here's your point for this morning. God has a vision for my current season and the relationships that matter most. We have every demographic you can imagine represented in our, con- in our congregation. And I want you to get, as we kick things off today, that God has a vision for your current season and the relationships that matter most in your life. He doesn't want you to flounder. He doesn't want you to approach them unintentionally. He doesn't want you to just go through the motions. God has a vision for you for this current season and the relationships that matter most. Now, I know what some people are thinking. Some people are thinking, Gabe, I I just can't get past this word vision. We do an assessment with our staff. It's called Strengths Finders. Have any of you ever taken that assessment before? It's kind of like the disc profile. There are others that are out there as well. But it just helps you learn a little bit more about yourself and how you're wired. My number one like strength is futuristic. If I can think and live in the future, I am a happy guy. Like, I love it. Like, I love thinking that way. Like, I wake up in the morning, I'm thinking, like, not about today. Like, I'm thinking about, like, next week, next month, next year, and so on. I just love to think future. Some of you are like, Gabe, that does not excite me, like, thinking that way. Vision doesn't excite me. Some of you, it amps you up. Others, you're like, no, 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 that's not who I am. Well, here's a word you can use in place of vision, okay? Plans. Some of you are laughing because like I'm not, a, you're saying I'm not a planner either, okay? Here's the deal. If neither one of these excite you, here's the good news for you. God is a visionary and God is a planner and God has a vision and God has a plan for your life. You may not have that, but God has that for you. I love this promise from Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11. Look at what the Lord says. He says, I know the plans I have for you. You may not have any, but I've got them. I've got a direction for your life, declares the Lord. What do they include? I love this. Look at it. Plans to look at that. Prosper you. God wants you to prosper. He wants you to flourish. He wants for your relationships to flourish. That that, that girl that you're dating, that guy you're dating, that relationship, he wants it to flourish. He has a goal for that, a vision for that, a plan for that. He wants to prosper you. He wants your marriage to prosper. You know that? 
He doesn't want your marriage to be mediocre, best of the worst, worst of the best. No, God wants you to flourish. Your parenting, God wants you to flourish as a parent. Can I be honest with you? Like there is no area of leadership that I feel more insecure in than, than in the area of parenting. Like my prayer a lot of days is, God, please help me not to mess these kids up. <laughs> but you know, God wants me to flourish as a dad. He wants that for you. He wants you to flourish in your relationships. L look at this, and not to harm you. God's plans for you are good. His plans are to lead you into a place of wholeness, into a healthy and a whole person. That's what his plans for you involve. He has that vision for your life. And you know what happens when you get healthier as an individual? The relationships you're in get healthier too. He doesn't want you codependent, like to be a control freak and this, that, and the other. He wants you to be a whole and healthy person. And it, it's gonna play its way out into every relationship of your life. I love this, plans to give you hope. Like right now, you're looking at your marriage, maybe you're looking at your past, you're thinking despair, and no, 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 no. That's not of, that's not of God. God's plans for you are to give you hope and I love this, a future. What that tells me is that if you don't like your current season, the good news for you is it, it does not have the final word on your life. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? It does not have the final word on your life. Whatever's happened to you, whatever mistakes you've made, you know, whatever mess you've even made of the past, that's not who you are. God has a vision for you, has a plan for you. God wants to do great things in and through you. So here's what I want to tell you this morning is today in week one, I want to make a case for why this discussion is so critical when it comes to family, but when it comes to any area of relationships, okay? And this is going to set us off or kick us off this morning. This quote from P.K. Bernard, a man, and I included, or woman, you're welcome, <laughs> without a vision. A man or woman without a vision is a man without a future. And a man without a future will always return to his past. You're going to keep going back to the only thing you know. You're going to keep going back to the familiar. You're going to keep going back to what you know. And, and there's a leadership saying, like, what got you to where you are will not get you to where you want to go. It's the definition of insanity to keep doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. It's not going to happen. And so what I want to do today is I want to teach from probably one of the most well-known verses we have in all of Scripture regarding vision. And to do that, I want to turn to Proverbs chapter 29. Proverbs chapter 29, and we're going to be kind of pulling, diving into and dissecting this one verse today. Proverbs 29 and verse number 18. You know, here's what the message says. If people, look at this, can't see what God is doing, your version of the Bible may say where there is no revelation or where there is no vision. In essence, when the people can't see what God is doing, what's the result? They do what? They stumble all over themselves. When the married couple can't see what God is doing, they keep going back to the same behaviors over and over again. When a couple that's dating can't see what God is doing, when they have no vision, they begin to treat their relationship as something that's disconnected from the purposes of God. When someone is single, can't see what God is doing, they begin to take matters and the pressure of provision into their own hands, thinking they have to provide for themselves, and with that, a temptation to settle for less than God's best for you. When the people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. And think about it, it's our nature. When you're going through the mundane and the routine and the ordinary, like day to day, it's so easy to get caught up in it, isn't it? And you just keep going through the same motions over and over and over again. But what if, look, before you jump into that next relationship, what if you just took time and stopped, you called a timeout, like, wait a minute, Maybe I should think about why the last one ended so bad before I jump into a new one. Maybe I should get a vision for what God wants for my relationship. Maybe I should get a vision for what God wants for, for this person I'm, I'm, I want to date or this person that I'm praying for that I want to marry. Maybe I should get God's vision for it because clearly my way hasn't worked out so well 
up until this, this point. I think about this with parenting. You know, we all have our children, our four children are all now from the ages of eight all the way down to an, to an infant, okay? So you guys pray for us, all right? I hope you're praying for your pastor and his wife, okay, every day. Um, but we have these four children, ages eight and under. And so again, I talked about our parenting being very reactionary. And I picked this up from our community group. This is why you need a community group, okay? There are two couples in our community group who are a couple of stages ahead of us in life. They've, they've raised their children. Their children have, have now married and, and are in that stage where they're leaving the home and so on. And so they were sharing how when they were raising their children, that one of the most important things they did when they raised their children was when it was those seasons where like the kids were like at each other's throat, like, you know what I mean, right? Everybody's like turning on each other and you're turning on them and you're turning on your spouse and like everybody's just like, you know, at each other, right? They had to just stop, stop and like, we're gonna have a family meeting. And they would get the whole family around the, uh, the dinner table and they would say, okay, we're gonna go around and we're gonna talk about how's your heart? How's your heart? You know, the way that you responded the other night, like, what is that? Like, and you know, and they would go around. Like, if it sounds really awkward, they said, look, it's gonna feel awkward initially, okay? But they said, you just keep at it. And after the third or the fourth time, what you'll find is, is they begin to open up. You got to learn to think differently. You got to reframe it. Like what got you to where you are will not get you to where you need to go. For heaven's sake, like if you end the first half and you're behind and you're losing, then get in the locker room at halftime, make adjustments and come out and win the second half. But don't come out of the second half and just think you can do the same thing and get the win. It doesn't work that way in any area of life and certainly not when it comes to relationships. If the people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. So I want to share with you a couple of places where vision is lacking in Scripture. Look at what happens when there is no vision. Exodus chapter 32, I love this verse. Moses is coming down off the mountain. He's just had this encounter with God. He's carrying the Ten Commandments on the two stone tablets. The Bible says they were inscribed by the finger of God. Think about that. Can you imagine the spiritual high that Moses is coming down off that mountain with, right? So he's coming down off that mountain, and I can just imagine it. He's like, I can't wait to see, show our people what God has given us. Like, look at this. Look what God has given us. And it doesn't take long to have his bubble burst. It says, Moses saw when he came down that the people were running wild and that Aaron had let them get out of control. And look at how sad this is. And so it become a laughing stock to their enemies. Their enemies had to do nothing to defeat them because they were doing a good job of that themselves. When I was reading this verse, the thought came to my mind. What is it in our life that's like dysfunctional or relationships that it's dysfunctional that we're attributing to the enemy? And the enemy's like, I've got nothing to do with that. That's just from a lack of vision. Because in our Christian world, like we like to blame everything on the devil. And I'm not saying, don't get me wrong. I know there's spiritual war, and I know it's intense. Like, believe me, I know spiritual war. But I just wonder, like, how much of the dysfunction in our relationships, it has nothing to do with the enemy. It just has from, does to do with a lack of vision. That's pretty challenging, isn't it? And that's okay. It's a good question to ask, isn't it? Here's another one. The book of Judges is infamous for how it ends. The very last verse, Judges 21, 25, in those days there was no king in Israel, so a lack of leadership is actually stated. And then look at this, a lack of vision is implied. What happened as a result? Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Which by the way, just as bad as not having a vision is having a vision for your life that isn't from God. That's just as devastating. You see, when it comes to this, we can't afford to get it wrong because of all that's at stake. 
And I, and I just know what some of us are thinking. Like, you're like, really, Gabe? Like, do I need to think this way about my family, about my marriage, about parenting, about dating, like about engagement, about grandparenting? Like, Gabe, like, like that's work stuff, okay? Like, I have to think about that at work. When I come home, like, I just, I just want to veg out and, like, check out. And, and I, don't, I just want to give it as little energy as possible. And I thought about that. And I'm like, but you know what? Like, how many of us, like, spend time, like, we have a vision for our fantasy football team. <laughs> and we got a vision for our golf score and our golf game. Like, I, I don't play golf anymore, like, I don't do anything I can't be good at, so I just stopped it all together. But <laughs> <laughs> like it never failed. Like what would happen to me is like I would play horrible the whole round and like my last shot of the whole day was like awesome. And I'd be like, well, maybe I can do this. And so I go, but like I thought, I thought back to the days when I did play golf, like I would think about it and I would make adjustments. I did this last time, it didn't work. I need to do this and so on. We've got a vision for hunting season. Like I, I love my yard. I love to do yard work. I know y'all think I'm crazy, probably some of you, but do you know that is so life-giving to me? Do you know I have a vision for my yard, what I want it to look like? And you know what I do with that vision? I work on it. I work on it every chance I get. I get a couple of free hours on the weekend. I work on it. I get a free evening. I work on that vision. And I spend time, like this vision I have for my yard, I spend time closing the gap between what I see and then what I actually have. I work hard on that. Like we got a vision for all these things that like are not bad things. But what I'm just saying is like what about when it comes to the current season I'm in and the relationships that matter most? God has that for us. And yes, it takes energy and it takes time and it takes effort, doesn't it? Like it takes work. It's true. There is no such thing as a great message, marriage without a lot of work. And the same thing with parenting and, and so on. You know, really what it comes down to is it comes down to this discussion, like am I going to be intentional or not intentional? I love what Pastor Craig Rochelle says. Look at this. Pick your pain because it is painful and it requires work to capture vision and to clarify it and to seek God for it and to, and to implement it. It takes work and it is painful at times. Can I get an amen? It's not easy. Vision is costly. It's not easy. But do you know the result of not having it? It's devastating. So you pick your pain. Pick your pain. A good friend of mine here at the point, an incredible business leader, Chip, um, business leader, incredible leader. We, we get together every so often and we talk just about what are you reading and business. And I just love to learn from all of our business leaders. It's just such a fascinating world for me. And, um, and so we were talking about the author, Patrick Lencioni. Do you guys know that name? He wrote books like The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, Death by Meeting, The Advantage, like just an incredible organizational and leadership expert. But Chip, Chip introduced me to a book I had not yet heard of. He wrote a book called The Three Questions for a Frantic Family. And he actually takes the same principles that he teaches in his leadership books. And he says, what if we applied these to the most important organization in our lives? The family. And I love what he said. Look at this. We somehow fail to see the cost of our chaos and the connection it has to real problems like poor mental health and physical health and financial failure and even divorce. And so we go on living context-free lives, taking on every decision and issue in a relatively isolated way as though it weren't part of a larger situation. And then we wonder why each day feels like a disconnected, reactive game of survival, a grind without the kind of purposeful progress that we all crave. Where there is no vision, people stumble all over themselves. You know, it's not just true for people with family. It's true for every area of relationships. 
Another one of my favorite authors is a guy by the name of Donald Miller. He wrote a book years ago called Blue Like Jazz. Some of you remember that book when it hit the Christian world. But he has recently, in the past several years, started a company called The Story Brand. And the whole point of his company is to help other companies clarify their story or clarify their vision, okay? So this is, this is our vision and this is what we're communicating. So anyways, he tells the story about his engagement process to his now wife, Betsy. Now, Betsy's living in Washington, D.C. She's very successful. She's lived there for many years, has a network of friends there that are very deep, and he lives in Nashville. And so he says that there's this season where she's about to leave D.C., this whole world that she knows, that she loves, and move to Nashville where she has none of that and have to start over more or less. And he said that in that season, there was this huge tension and like frustration that was beginning to surface in their engagement that they hadn't experienced before. And they were both kind of like reeling, like, what do we do with this? Like, what, what exactly is going on here? And so he said, one day it hits him. He's actually consulting with a business and, um, and it hits him while he's consulting that I spend all of this time clarifying a story, a vision for all these companies and I haven't even taken time to do it for my fiance. Like, what kind of story am I inviting her into? And so, on the break, he excuses himself and he sends her a quick text message. And he says, I want our marriage to be a restorative marriage. Vision. I want it to be a restorative marriage. And then he goes down and he lists, like, what does that look like? And then he says... Like, he thinks to himself, she's going to kill me for treating our relationship like a business plan. Instead, she messages him back, and she says, Don, this is what I needed. If plans or vision don't resonate with you, think about it in terms of this story. Because there's a story that's unfolding, a huge story, God's story. And right now we're in this phase of the story called redemption and God is redeeming and God is working and God is on the move. And what I'm just saying is when we talk about a vision and, a, and, a, and plans and so on, it's this process of aligning ourselves with this incredible story of God that we've been invited into. And it's about aligning ourselves and it's about aligning the relationships that matter most with that story. And I'm telling you, like I've said it this way, like your own glory is way too small a thing to live for. It's the exact same discussion, just in a different way. God has this amazing story and he's inviting us in. He has a vision for you. And let me just say that any vision that doesn't come from God is a vision that's too small. I wanted to give you two points for this morning, okay? I've already given you one, so I can't call it the point, but think of this, what I'm about to give you, as like 1B, okay? So write this down. God's vision isn't just what we see. It's the way in which we see. God's vision isn't just what we see. It's the way in which we see. It's this new framework. We're talking about reframing. It's this new framework through which I see life and through which I see the relationships that matter most. I heard a story about a traveler who came upon three men that were working on the same project. And he comes up to the first man and he says, what are you doing? And the man is like, what does it look like I'm doing? I'm laying bricks. He comes up to the second man. He says, what are you doing? And the man's like, I'm putting up a wall. He asks the third man, what are you doing? And the man says, I'm building a great cathedral. The first man had a job, the second man had a career, but the third man had a vision. Let me say it again. The first had a job, the second had a career, but the third man had a vision, a vision. He was building something great. And do you know that's what God wants for you? 
He wants you from this big picture of who he is and his plan of redemption unfolding the world where he's in the process of making everything right and working everything for his glory and for our good. This vision that's unfolding, he's inviting you into it. He has a vision, and that vision has implications for you. It has implications for your marriage, and it has implications for your children. It even has implications for this rough patch that you're in in your marriage. It has implications for the separation you're going through, for the divorce that you're experiencing, it has implications for those of you that are grandparents. Can I, can I just say to you that there's never a better time than right now to get a vision for your role for this current season of your life? Think about that. And I know what it's like. Hey, listen, I know this kind of talk, it stirs the soul a little bit, right? And so the temptation is for a lot of us to feel bad and to think, gosh, like, why wasn't I thinking this way way back when? Look, that, that's not my intent this morning. I want to encourage you. I want to pump you up, and I want you to know that the God that we serve is not as concerned about your past as he is where you're headed, okay? So what I'm saying is, is that we want to, he wants to change the way we see things, and if we're going to get God's vision, what that means is we got to be people of the word, and we got to be people in the word. If we're going to get God's vision, do you know that God's vision comes through his word? It comes through God's word. His vision for your life, it'll never contradict his word. And God has a vision for, your, for that relationship, that dating. He has a vision for your marriage, for every area of life you can imagine. God has a vision for that area, for the season you're in, and for relationships that matter most. I said this years ago, that vision will cost you, but doing nothing about it will kill you. And it won't just kill you. It'll end up killing the relationships that matter most to you. So, like I shared with you, a couple months ago, the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and he said, why are you not as intentional with vision in your marriage and in your parenting? And he said, it's time to do something about it. And so I started this journey, and this is the journey that I'm in. It's the journey I'm going to bring you along on, okay? But let me just tell you, okay, if you want to take this conversation seriously, then then. I'm going to give you some homework, all right? You're like, Gabe, it's Father's Day. Like, <laughs> homework. No, no, no. Let me just tell you. Here's where this begins. It begins by diving into the Word of God and asking God to give you verses, to give you scripture, to give you a clear picture of his vision for that area of your life, for that relationship, for wherever it is, whatever season you're currently in. You say, Gabe, how do I do that? Let me get really practical with you. It used to be we'd tell you to, to open up the concordance in the back of the Bible. You remember those things, the concordances? That's how we would used to tell you to do it. But we have this thing now called the Internet. <laughs> and on the Internet, there's this thing, place called Google. And I'm not kidding. You type in Scripture, Scripture for dating. You type in scripture for marriage, scripture for engagement. Type in scripture for someone going through divorce, scripture for grandparents. And you ask God to speak to you this week. And then you begin to just search. You pull up those scriptures, the list that they get or whatever, and then you just begin to read through them. And you begin to pray through them. And you ask God to give you a clear vision. Like, I don't know how to get any more practical than that. Like, really? And then here's the deal. Here's the deal. Now that you've heard the challenge, you've got a decision to make. You can take what I've shared this morning, and you can do nothing with it. And you can keep getting the same results. Or, or, you can dive in. You can ask God to speak. You can ask God for vision. You can dive into the word. You can get a verse or two or three or four that begins to form this vision in you. I'm going to tell you that this discussion is just beginning this morning, and it's going to take work. I'm going to do my best to lead you through it because I really believe. I believe with all my heart that God is inviting us into this incredible story. 
And I believe with all my heart that so many of us, like we're wasting our time and we're spinning our wheels because we're missing it. And what it's time to do is it's time to get God's vision for us. It's time to get clarity. It's time to seek him for it. And it's time to experience this incredible story that he's inviting us into. Now, where this begins is it begins with God's vision for you is to know him as Lord and Savior. And if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, this is where this discussion begins. That's where it starts. You say, what's God's will for me? What's God's vision for me? Number one, God's vision is that you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You open your heart. You ask him to be the Lord of your life, and you live for him from this day forward. So what I'm going to do as we wrap up today is I'm going to lead you in a prayer that gives you that opportunity to open your heart to Jesus Christ, to say, Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I want to live for you from this day forward. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you. Thank you so much. For this morning, thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to encounter you through your word. And God, I really believe, Lord, as your word says, that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joint and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of our heart. God, I really believe that your word, God, has just kind of laid our hearts open before you today. And I thank you for it, Lord. And it can be hard, and it can be challenging, and and even sometimes painful. But God, we know what your word says. We know the plans you have for us to prosper us, not to harm us, to give us hope and to give us a future. Jesus, we just want to align ourselves with you, completely with you, with your truth, with your word, with your power today, Lord. So, God, as you know every heart that is here, God, challenge us. God, may this week, Lord, be the week that married couples, Lord, maybe for the first time ever they open the word together. They ask you to speak to them, to give them vision for their marriage. God, may this be the week that parents, Lord, who maybe are struggling, that are drowning, that don't know which way to turn or what to do, may this be the week, Lord that the shift happens in the heart where they look to your word and they ask you, Lord, we can't do it on our own anymore. Give us a vision, Lord. God, may this be the week, Lord, that that couple that's dating, may they make a decision, God, to put you at the center of their relationship. And, And through that, Lord, dedicate themselves to a life of holiness and purity, walking. Jesus, with your vision at the forefront of their relationship, God, I pray for the grandparent, Lord, that's struggling. God, give them vision today, God. Give them vision this week. May you begin to form vision in them, Lord. Where they get a clear picture of the season. And God, the opportunity to make the greatest impact of their lives right now in this season. Jesus, I pray most of all for the heart that's here, maybe watching online, that's never trusted you as Lord and Savior. May today be the day of salvation where they step from death into life, experiencing your vision for them, that they know you as Lord and Savior. Maybe they've known about you their whole life, but they've never known you. Today, may they have that encounter, step from death into life, into a relationship with you for the first time. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed, Everybody's very still and quiet for just a moment. If you've never trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior, today you want to say yes for the very first time. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I'm going to ask you pray this out loud after me. And I'm going to ask we all pray it out loud to support each of you who are making this decision for the first time today. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for sending him to die on the cross for my sin. Come into my heart. Cleanse me of my sin and give me the courage to live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen.